Good morning. Whew. I don't know. God is working and so is the devil. Everything is overtime. Uh, as you saw my post, some of you have already seen my post about in the area that I live in, um, we had a sheriff deputy that was uh, shot uh, and, and has died and left family. And so it just seems like there, there becomes more and it becomes more, more, you know, sometimes we are so removed when we're removed. We don't think of how it affects us. Sin touches people's lives. That incident that, that happened yesterday <clears throat> is a perfect example. And, and even today in American history, uh, today is September 11th, and um, that one event 19 years ago when the Twin Towers uh, were, were um, shot down has continued to touch our lives. There were good people that um, ha were there during that high crisis. Um, you know, airplanes were going down. Lots of things happened. And it still touches the lives of people today, positively and negatively. That is how sin works. And that is also how grace is, because God does continue to provide grace in the midst of our storms. As difficult as that is, and that is why we cling, we need to cling to the old rugged cross. We need to be anchored um, to the one who will bring us through the storm, will bring us safely in the ark. This is why we need um, a savior. And so today's praise, <clears throat> which may seem to be a little bit uplifting than uh, as far as in the melody, uh, we need to be able to praise him. We need to redirect our focus on what is, that what we are seeing is the result of a spiritual battle that is raging on and the heat is going up. This is just like cancer in the sense that sometimes we don't see the cancer on the inside until it can be too late and there are results that we see either it rises to the surface and we see it on our bodies um, or we are very sick. This is what's happening. This is why we need a savior. So let's sing um, a song at Calvary because that's where, that's where salvation comes from. That's where this relief that we need is going to come from him because mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. Pardon, multiple forgiveness. There my burdened soul. If you're burdened today, this is where you get your freedom at Calvary. Years are spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did spend at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I pray a special covering um, of mercy and grace today as emotions um, and thoughts run 
high that you will bring your peace and healing. Father, I pray that you will bring comfort as well for those that are experiencing loss and wondering where you are in this storm. Let them feel your presence because, Lord, we need this. Your church needs this. We need a revival to occur in the church so that we can rise up and share the good news. Father, as we sit and learn, may our eyes be open today in this message. Thank you for your many blessings in your precious and holy name. Amen. So we are at Genesis chapter 11. We are slowly plugging along. I know we haven't even gotten halfway through the book, but there's been so much information. This chapter is the pivotal chapter because it concludes universal history. We have learned where sin had originated. Where did it come from? We know it came from the garden that, oh, my nose is itching, um, <laughs> comes from. And that because of our choice that in the garden where we chose to disobey, we brought sin and we must pay for our sins. Um, sin opened the door to separation from God and from man. What does that mean? It meant that we brought death. Often we think of death as a physical thing where our bodies die and um, we go into the ground and then there's that physical separation from uh, that person for what could be eternity or it could be a lifetime. Um, but let me, let me just say that death is more than a physical uh, experience. Death brings about many other things. It brings the death of relationships, marriages. If your marriage ends in divorce, that is the death of, of that relationship, of that union that, that God, God desired to have um, between a man, one man and one woman. It is the, yes, it is the separation of the body and soul, the mind and the spirit. And while we are doomed to die, to pay for our sins eternally, which we, we don't even begin to understand that um, word, eternal, God promised restoration in the garden because he, he values, he loved his creation so much. So he promises that mankind will be restored through a perfect human being that we don't realize at that time that this is going to be something that God does. Um, and, and what we see in these chapters is, is that we can't live a righteous life. Man continues to choose for himself his selfish desires over doing the right thing. Um, when they are uh, blocked and we don't get what we want, we don't get the rec recognition, Many times we become like Cain, and we, uh, and we read in the story of Cain, the first murder. We also read how marriages are distorted in the, through the line of Cain. One of his own has now married two women. So we've got this constant slowly building, this cancerous sin that is, is in, it permeating and infecting mankind and creation because creation suffered death as well um we we see that uh that sin and evil permeates naturally because then we read about the the sons of god and the daughters of men and they mix together and that evil seems to pull down the righteous to where God had to intervene and call in judgment because if not, he would have, we would have, we would have killed each other. This is very contrary to the philosophical teachings that man gets better. Um, there is a, a thought that we will evolve into becoming better, that we will ha eventually have a superior race. I think that's what Hitler tried to do, even though he himself was not a superior race. Um, everything that he was, he rejected and sought to kill and, and change. We don't get better. 
And, and if you think that we do, I would suggest that you look at the world around you because there's nothing good by what man has done. We ha There are some things that we may have temporarily improved, but our attitude, we can make all the laws that we want to. We can force people to obey those laws, but until the heart is changed, and that's where God sees things, until the heart is changed, my dear brothers and sisters, nothing will change. If God does not put a, a heart, a new heart, a heart and removes the heart of stone from our lives, we will always seek ourselves first. And um, right now, there just doesn't seem to be a lot of peace. Um, we, we see that God called uh, into accounting mankind. You know, he promised uh, that there will not be another flood uh, judgment or water judgment um, to mankind, but one of fire. He has provided, and they didn't know this then, but he provides an ark that is perfect and will carry those who choose to enter into uh, the safety of all eternity. Um, the body may be, you know, if, if the Lord tarries, I could die. I'm slated to die. My body and my soul will be separated for a period of time. However, through Christ, I am promised that my body will be resurrected. It'll be changed. I mean, even at, even at the rapture, it says that in the twinkling of the eye, all these imperfections that we experience, glasses, hearing aids, fake teeth, fake whatever, medicines, everything will be changed. We'll be perfect. We will have the perfect resurrected bodies just like Christ. Isn't that exciting? We'll be able to walk through walls. <laughs> <laughs> and yet we'll be able to eat solid food. We will be both. We will defy the physics of this earth because we will have those wonderful things that perfected. And um, so if you have thinning hair like I do, wow, I, I look forward to a nice full, I never had a full uh, head of hair, so I really <laughs> I look forward to that. Um, and such, you might go, that, that's awkward. That's life. Uh, so we come to this chapter uh, that God, because man is unified at this time for languages, and we've read that in chapter 10, that all of these languages exist and, and these tribes exist. What does that mean? Um, and we're going to read how God has put into place barriers to slow down man's self-destruction um, because he allows and he works within our framework. He puts in barriers to protect us from ourself <laughs> so that his will happens. Um, and, and he did. He allowed thousands of years from the time of Adam uh, and the original sin to... The time that Christ walked on earth. And so we start chapter 11. It says, the tower, this is the Tower of Babel, or Babel. At one time, all the people of the earth spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. And you know, it makes perfect sense that everybody spoke the same language. I mean, after all, there were only eight people that got on the ark and, from the same family who spoke the same language before they got on the ark. And if they, if they didn't speak the same language, they were now. And so um, from the end of chapter 9 and to this particular story, there are overlapping stories and family lines. The, the, the earth, uh, man has started... Uh, being fruitful and multiplying. It is in the previous chapters, uh, when we, uh, previous chapter, that it's noted that the three lines start to spread and to start to settle. Noah's line through his sons are creating generations. Um, it's not certain that if all the families decided to make this move, uh, 
to the east of what we know as uh, Babylonia or Shinar, or if it was just the land, uh, the line of Ham. Um, but once the people started to spread, language barriers did did um, occur. Um, and that is one thing that people do agree. Ham did indeed move and create, and his line created for themselves a place in the land of Babylonia. We saw that in chapter 10. And then they begin saying to each other, let us make bricks and harden them in the fire. In this region, bricks was used instead of stone and tar was used um, for mortar. And they said, come, let us build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. And because they could speak the same language, they could share the same thoughts, the same feelings, the same ideas. And as previously mentioned in the previous chapter, uh, through Nimrod, the line of Ham, they were very rebellious in their actions. Was building a city wrong? No, it was not. It gave them a place of security, um, but it was a false security because when you, you put your trust in man-made things over God, you are, you are elevating man to um, a higher level than what he was intended. Uh, so with Nimrod, and he's rebelling against God. He's leading the way uh, there. Con he's convinced the people that they need to wipe God out of their lives. Kind of sounds familiar. When we do that kind of thing, uh, anarchy and chaos arrives on the scene when we remove God from our lives. And um, the people followed. We've got followings now. Uh, their thoughts were to show um, how they could exist without their helps, uh, that their way was better than God's way. Um, they, 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 they were bringing God down to their level. We do that. We need God to be like us so that we can justify. I mean, when you read Greek and Roman mythology or you read about any of the gods that man has... Uh, ordained or created when we when we read that we also see the sin in their lives they had adulterous relationships they did terrible things uh, they divorced they killed so when you have that then you can excuse uh, your own you can justify well the gods did that well see the thing is is that God doesn't do that and his, his ways are much higher, and he raises the bar uh, in, in that he says, I don't do those things, therefore you shouldn't be doing those things. As me being as your God, I am higher than you. And as, as human beings, we want to be in control of what we think is our own universe. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. There is a story uh, that goes around that says, um, it's God versus the scientist. And God was sitting in one uh, heaven one day, and uh, when when science came to him, and uh, these scientists said, "God, we don't need you anymore. Science has finally figured out a way to create life without uh, without out of nothing. In other words, we now can do what you did in the beginning. And if you think that 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 we would have the audacity of doing that, I have read." that science has, has taken apart um, and removed different things in a test tube trying to recreate life. It keeps surfacing. That, man, that is man's challenge to be able to recreate life. So in this story, that's what happens. Oh, is that so? Replies God. Well, says the science, we can take dirt and form it into the likeness of you and breathe life into it and create a man. And God replied, that is interesting. Show me. And so the scientist, just, you know, very prideful, loves his great idea. And he bends down to the earth to start to mold the soil into the shape of man. And God interrupts, no, no, now get your own dirt. 
<laughs> um, we I do not have the power to create something out of nothing. Uh, and God does challenge that. Get your own dirt uh, and such. And while we may chuckle at that story, it shows that man has not changed. Instead of becoming uh, discouraged that there were no stones available in that land, they become creative to their own thinking. You know, stones is something that would be God provided. And what do we do? We resort to uh, <clears throat> something of lesser quality. And they, they made up uh, bricks. And, and so once they succeed in this, they, they feel good about their handiwork. Well, this is good. We did a good thing. Let's make some more. Um, and, and so they, they continue to, to build this. And through Nimrod, they decide to make this great city. Hey, I got an idea. Yeah, I've got a really big idea. Let's build a city. Let's, uh, let's build something as high as the heavens. You know, that was, that was Lucifer's problem. Pride is the, is, the, is the root of all the other stuff. When we think that someone has something over us, it hurts our pride. And when we get, when we feel like we've done a good thing and we get passed over, and somebody gets recognition or someone gets recognition for what we have been doing all along, it hurts our pride. And um, and Lucifer fell because of pride. He felt that he, being a creation, should supersede and rise above the creator. And um, that didn't happen. And so they, they, they decided, see, this is the problem. They decided to build a city for their fame and glory. They wanted eternal um, people remembering them. You know, names are important. We name cities. Most cities are named after dead people. It's a memorial. It's a testimony. See, we remember this, you know, in the line of Cain. He built a city. He named it after his son. This, this going, this is repeating that hundreds Hundreds, almost uh, probably thousands of years later, because you know, the oldest man, Methuselah, was 965 years, and that was pre flood. So now there's time that's happened. So, you know, over a good thousand years. And so they want a tower that would reach the heaven to show God that they weren't afraid of Him. You know, they probably postured themselves of, of show me, let me show you God. Let me show you, I'm not afraid of you. I'm not raising the fist to him. We will build, we will build a tower. Um, and instead of spreading out and maybe building other cities, like God had commanded um, in verse uh, chapter nine, verse seven, they intentionally disobey God. They have this fear that the flood is going to come again. See, when we stop believing God, then we wonder whether his promises are true. He had already said there wasn't going to be a flood. And what do we do? We go, there's going to be another flood and we're going to be ready for it. Because, you know, God may not be telling us the truth. And we get that attitude and we do this in our own personal lives. Because I know that I fall short when I don't trust him because I know the situation better. Uh, I know this is how I need to react. This is what I need to do. It makes common sense to me, and it made common sense to them. You know, God may not be truthful. He may be angry because we he, they had already started lowering their expectations of who God was based on who they were. And, and so they knew that uh, God had told them to, to scatter, to spread, and they didn't want to. There's safety in numbers. And, um, you know, if God God says that we can spread out, it means that we can. Because he is going, he's, he's got us. If we're walking with him, we don't have to be afraid. Now, I'm not saying go down a dark alley where you know it's a dangerous place and go, God's got me. God does, says, do not put me to the test. But if he's told you to walk down there, and you were to get attacked, you can't say, well, God, you let me down. No, God had a purpose for you. Just make sure that you're walking with God before you, <laughs> you 
uh, do something of that nature. Um, and so, so if it's not God's will, you know that you will not be um, harmed in a in a way that would call, bring about your death. You don't die before your time. Even those that commit suicide. That's right. Because then if you're saying that man is in control of, of his, his life and he can commit suicide and he ends his time, that is a lie because God is in control. God does not approve of suicide, but he will allows it because of man. So be aware, you cannot judge suicide that man has taken life into his own hands and God didn't know about it. God still allows that because of the parameters of sin. And that does not mean that someone who dies by their own hands, that they are um, not going to heaven. I know that is a, a thing that has gone around. Yes, all life is precious. But salvation is based on what Christ did, not what we do. Um, so while, it, while we can say it is a sin, that is not the unpardonable sin that people go around and say. Because if that is the case, then we will never, ever enter to his presence because sin, it, because what Christ did would be not enough. Christ's blood covered those moments. It is a selfish moment um, that happens because so many people are left in its wake. It hurts. Sin touches lives. It affects and impacts all those around, big and little. And so it says, the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. Now, this is very interesting in that um, Jewish theology teaches that God came down to demonstrate how judges need to examine each situation before they execute judgment. Now, when it says, come, let us go down, it wasn't that God didn't know. He was very aware of what was going to happen. He was aware of the present. But what it does show is, is that God inspects before he passes judgment. We see this presence of him. He, he has opened this for them to see. They acknowledge that God is all-knowing but will demonstrate to man. See, we, we, still need, we still need guidance. How does man judge a situation? When you are put in that position to judge, you need to review the evidence. You need to see what, what has happened so that you can rightly judge um, an event. God knows that the people did not learn their lesson from the flood, and sometimes um, it's not worth disciplining a child the same way you just did if they're not changing. Sometimes you got to do something different. And we've already seen that that life here is is a mighty warrior of men. That means that the killing has started again. Um, Noah was alive. Uh, Close to this time, if we if we look at if we run the genealogies uh, down to to this moment, you know they are united. They they don't care again. They have no respect of what happened prior. You know that happened then. It is not happening now. <clears throat> it won't happen to me again. I don't really care. I mean, you know, history is always will repeat itself if man does not repent and return to Christ. And the arrogance and the pride that these people must have felt. You know, even today, we rarely learn from our past mistakes or history. In America right now, we're toppling down, or there's been a slowdown to it, but we're talking about getting rid of all these monuments so that we don't have to remember that these things existed. I hate to say this to the Americans, um, 
which are my people, just because you don't want it to exist doesn't mean that it didn't happen. I know that there are people that are wanting to pretend that the Holocaust didn't exist. And when we do that, when we, when we say it didn't exist, guess what? We will experience another Holocaust when we say it didn't exist and therefore I'm going to write it out of history. And it doesn't mean that it didn't exist just because you wrote it out. I can sincerely believe two plus two is five and be angry and shove it down everybody's throat and still be wrong, sincerely wrong. And, and so people were remaining um, united and God wasn't worried about, I'm gonna tell you this language thing that comes up, God's not worried about being overthrown by mankind. He can't be overthrown. If he was not overthrown by Lucifer, then he's not going to be overthrown by us because we were made a little lower than the angels. So we have less power than the angels, even though we're created in his image. So he's not worried about man overthrowing him. He's not suddenly his feelings hurt. He has a plan. He is going to stick to his will. He keeps his promises, and, and he is slowing down the cancer. He knew that we were going to become selfish. He knew that we'd be wicked, and we would destroy ourselves. The psalmist says, and we've memorized this verse, Psalm 16, 2, I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. We do not do well left to our own devices. There's just nothing good. And the fitting punishment would be allow man, because he's made this promise, to struggle in communication. You know what? <laughs> it, 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 it does. Um, man has struggled to learn how to learn somebody else's language. I'm telling you right now, people say, how much Greek do you know? I don't. How much Hebrew do you know? Because I'm in my second... Uh, eight weeks of this, I don't. It's killing me how much I'm supposed to know. And my mind is just like blown away. It is work to learn languages and to break down barriers. And man works for that. Uh, today we experience and struggle all sorts of language barriers. Some of it can be even sign language. There is not a universal, universal language anymore. Um, But in heaven, here's the good news, there will not be a language barrier. Now, will we speak our own native tongue? Maybe. I think it'll be the language of love. But you know, God is God. He's got his own thing. It may not even be a language that we even speak now. It may be a completely new language. Why wouldn't we? We're getting new bodies. Um, why wouldn't we get a new language? And it will be covered in love because God is love and we will experience and, and give that to each other. That's, that's so exciting. <laughs> um, so the judgment, instead of fire or water or whatever, the judgment was not towards the city, but dividing us to keep us from being united for self-destruct. That's what this is about um, because giving us that division, he is going to eventually heal us. Um, another point is, is that God was not going to share his glory and his name then for some city, and he's not going to do it today. He is consistent in his word. He says, I will never share my glory with my creation. Not that way. You may experience my glory, but I'm not going to share it. We are not going to walk hand in hand, and you think that you are equal to me. Um, when you have small children, they are not equal to an adult. They do not have the same rights in the sense that uh, they can't just decide that they're going to go off and drive a car because that's what they want or be able to do whatever they want to without parents' permission. They are under the guardianship 
because the parents make the, supposed to make the wise choices. <laughs> God's attitude is the same way, except his is perfect because he knows better than we do all the time and will never, ever, ever make a mistake. <laughs> so, so we've got, uh, you know, he's not going to share his name. He's not going to say that we are equal or superior to him. Uh, there's a saying, and I love this saying, atheism is a temporary condition. It's guaranteed because it says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. You can find this in Philippians 2, 9 verses, 11, uh, verses 9 through 11 and Romans 14, 11, uh, 11 through 12. Oh, and Isaiah. We wonder where, where Paul got this information. Um, he was well known in his own scriptures, which is important to us, Isaiah 45, 53. And since our uh, knee indicates a submission to him sometime in our life, then we will never be equal to or superior because a, a superior person never has to kneel before someone who is equal to. Now, you may say, well, there are greetings of respect. That is a completely different thing, but God will never kneel to his creation. But we, as his creation, will. It is guaranteed. It is in the scripture, and God does not lie. We will all take a knee to him. And so in that way, verse 8, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. That's one way to stop it. <laughs> um, that is why the city was called Babel, because this is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. So now man is speaking in multiple languages. Uh, God's design plan would prevail, and it continues to prevail. In that way, he scattered people in their own regions and in their own language, you know, it happened, this kind of thing, if you want to think about it, happened to the church early on in the book of Acts. The church was multiplying, and it was growing in Jerusalem. And you know what? Jesus said before he ascended, go ye therefore into all the earth, and, and go into, you know, starting with the family, which was Judea, and then into Samaria, and then to the uh, outer parts of the world through all the corners of the earth and what were they doing they were growing and they were multiplying and they were remaining in Jerusalem and they were not sharing the gospel it, some of them were it was a little bit of trickling but I'm gonna tell you that when Saul and the religious leaders uh, of uh, Judaism decided that there was just too much competition Everybody started scattering, and they all started sharing the good news. So uh, they, they weren't necessarily prideful, but they were still disobedient to what they were told to do. And sometimes we have to, just like uh, adult eagles will do to their eaglets, is, is they remove the comforts of the, uh, of the nest so that they become uncomfortable and decide to leave and fly away. Uh, but the good thing is that when they're in that process of flying, God, uh, the eagle, flies under the eaglet so that it's, it's not going to crash to the, the, their doom. God sets us up for success, even when it's physical loss. And, and you know, we are moving to a one world uh, type of language. You know, the barriers are quickly being broken down. I, when I have um, my Hispanic speaking people or uh, my Ukrainian people, I can now go to Google Translate, put in my English and then find a, a language. And I hope that it's translated <laughs> correctly. I always ask my parents, that have limited English. I hope this translated correctly. I've also seen videos where you can speak into this box and then you can, it 
translates that. That is so cool. But as we are becoming more um, language barrier broken, meaning that the barriers are being removed, we're slowly becoming united. We're slowly becoming united. And guess what's happening when we're starting to understand each other? We're starting to repeat what was happening at the Tower of Babel. We are starting to see the signs of the times of Noah because life is being taken. Man can't survive without. And I do believe that in our pain and our suffering, that God is going to do something amazing first with his church. He always starts with family first. And then he will move to everyone else. He is going to cleanse the church. That's why I'm very, very excited about studying the Jewish festivals because they do have impact and bearing. And I do believe that things are, are coming. And, and I'm hearing among other believers, we need to be looking up. You're right, we do. And so in order for us to do that, we are going to be studying these, these uh, amazing moments of celebration for us to to maybe celebrate physically with, but also to recognize how God is moving. So today, no new memory verse. We are just continuing to uh, uh, study or review John 14, 1 through 7. We will come back Monday with a new, new verses, probably still in John 14, but a little bit later. Um, Continue to be in prayer uh, for our nation, our countries, for the leaders. We so need this. And for our church leaders, especially our church leaders, that they help us continue to grow. Because temptations, they are human beings, and they also choose to make bad choices. And those in leadership... When we start seeing that happen, where they fall, they do need to be removed so that they can be restored because they lead their congregations into sin. And we don't need that to happen. We don't need the wolves among the sheep. So be in, prepare, in prayer for your leaders at your churches. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for your covering. Lord, you are moving in a mysterious way, but yet in the same breath, you reveal to us and you have said that to be looking for signs of your return and that we should be awake and we should be prepared. And one of the important things is that we are about your your business, that we show that love and compassion that you did when you were walking here on earth and that you, that you shared who you were to bring that promise that you loved us enough. You said that, that um, through your son to Nicodemus that you loved this world, that whosoever believed in your son because the one that you gave would not die if they believed on him but have eternal life. Father, if there are those um, in this mist hearing this that do not know you personally, Lord, I pray that they will come to know you in a personal way, to have that personal relationship, to be restored, to be forgiven and restored. Father, thank you so very much. I pray over the leaders of our churches. I pray over the leaders of our uh, local communities and then also our states and our countries that there is wise counsel, that they start walking in your ways. Um, bring us back at the appointed time. Thank you again for your many blessings in your precious and holy name. Amen. Have a wonderful weekend. I can't wait to see you next week. Bye.